Ugh, I hate these stupid sunglass lenses. Now, if you guys have seen me before, you know I have in the past had these really nice bright orange mesh lenses, which were impossible to see into, but easy for me to see out of them, due to my eyes proximity to them. This served me very well for everything from engaging in conversations on the street, to even gymnastics and parkour. They're the type of thing that required some getting used to, but after a while, I forget they were there. Contrast that with these lenses, which look freaking incredible, but holy shit, I can never get them to not fog up. I've tried everything from anti-fog spray to breathing downward, and nothing has saved these for me. But they did give me a blueprint. These lenses could easily be popped out and replaced with anything that was the same shape, so I figured, why not 3D print my own plastic mesh, heat it up, form it to the contour of the lenses, cut it to the boundary of the lenses, and voila, my mask has some new spiffy eyes. At first, printing the mesh was difficult. I found this nice hex pattern from an existing STL file for Spider-Man lenses on Thingiverse, but my printer isn't precise enough to make a small enough mesh such that it's opaque when viewed at a distance. It is then that I noticed the potential of a raft pattern. Now, a raft is a common method of print bed adhesion where several layers of material of varying density are deposited on the bed before the actual part is printed. This will often take the form of parallel lines that change orientation by 90 degrees each layer. The result is a mesh with square holes. The holes in this mesh can be as small as you want. It all depends on the distance between the parallel lines. So this is the pattern that I used. And after heating, forming, and cutting, the lenses were beautiful. So you're probably wondering, where does non-planar slicing, or as I like to call it, contoured 3D printing, come in? Well, this was 2020. In 2021, my lenses were shattered in the wash. All of my attempts to repeat the process were unsuccessful. I seem to have forgotten the magic of mesh lens making. However, there was hope. I recalled a video I had seen a couple of years ago from Teaching Tech about non-planar slicing, where the upper layers of a part would be made out of contoured layers rather than planar layers, as in traditional 3D printing. This was also called true 3D printing, as it requires all three axes to move simultaneously, something that traditional planar 3D printing avoids. I thought, what if all of those upper layers made up the thing that was the part? The way I see it, you could have a support structure printed with planar slicing, made of a material that does not adhere to your lens material. Then you could have two simple layers of a raft pattern, each with equally spaced parallel lines, but between the layers, the lines would have a 90 degree difference in orientation. They would be orthogonal to each other. Then you could print a solid border around the raft pattern that could be popped into the lens frame which is attached to your mask. Seems like a perfect application to me, no forming or cutting required. It was the perfect time for me to cross something off my bucket list. I'd like to remake the movie Kazam with Shaquille O'Neal where he plays a genie and I'd like to get it right. But how? I would need a program that can slice an STL file into planar layers, as usual, but then after all the planar layers have been printed, it would need to print contoured layers, each one with both border and infill. These contoured layers would need to be made of equally spaced parallel paths, which closely follow the contour of the geometry beneath it, whether that be the previous contoured layer or the combination of all the planar layers, as is the case in the first contoured layer. This brings us to the problem of drawing paths on a contoured surface. For a flat plane, making equally spaced parallel paths is easy. Your lines can be straight, they never cross. At any point on this path, the adjacent paths will be the same distance from it. In this planar space, we are dealing with Euclidean geometry, where parallel lines are easy to construct. Euclid, an ancient Greek philosopher and this space's namesake, demonstrated how to craft parallel lines in a plane. You draw a line, then a second line perpendicular to that line, and then a third line perpendicular to that second line. Your first and third lines are parallel. But when we deal with drawing these contoured layers, our geometries are no longer Euclidean. Now this actually has some freaky implications for not just my brain when trying to write this code, but also for our entire universe. So I just have to figure out how to draw straight parallel paths in a non-Euclidean space. Impossible. Picture the planet Earth. Definitely a spheroid, not flat. As a result, geometry on the surface is non-Euclidean. 
it exhibits positive curvature, a geometry called elliptic. The lines of longitude are constructed in the same way Euclid demonstrated the construction of parallel lines. A single longitude is perpendicular to the equator, which is perpendicular to any other longitude. But these lines are not parallel. They cross at the poles. Keep in mind, this forms a triangle where the sum of the angles are greater than 180 degrees. So longitudes should not be used as 3D printing paths, as they are not equally spaced at every point. This would result in a buildup of material where these lines get closer to each other, and a sparseness where these lines get farther apart. You can't build a solid surface like that. But what about latitude? Assuming a perfectly spherical shape, these paths are equally spaced anywhere. One degree of latitude on the Earth is always going to be equal to about 111.2 kilometers, no matter where you are. These paths never cross. Notice how I'm using the word paths rather than lines. Because are these paths straight? No. Nowhere is this more apparent than at the poles, where following a latitude means walking in a strict circle. But this is the case for all latitudes. In spherical geometry, the only straight lines are along the circumference of a circular cross-section that intersects the center of a sphere. So while all longitudes are straight lines, the only straight line of latitude is the equator. If you try to walk along any of these lines, you'll drown. But if you could walk on water, you'd find yourself never having to make a turn. However, following the latitude lines means turning is required. In the northern hemisphere above the equator, heading west means constantly turning to the right, so that you're traveling in a circle around the North Pole. In the southern hemisphere, below the equator, heading west means constantly turning to the left, so that you're traveling in a circle around the South Pole. So the longitudes aren't parallel, but the latitudes aren't straight. But it doesn't really matter if the paths aren't straight. If you had to print a spherical surface, your paths would be equally spaced latitudes. That's the only way to get no gaps and no buildup. In any case, we know our paths cannot possibly be straight to be equally spaced. An ant walking along them would have to make a large number of turns, and we know that they have to be equally spaced along any point in the path. So I came up with a method to generate these paths. Now, I should warn you, I'm not a mathematician or a software developer, so I can't confirm that my way is the best way, but I think it's interesting, so I'd like to share it with you. I figured I'd first need an initial path, for which all other paths are drawn in reference to. I elected to simply bisect the surface geometry with a vertical plane, and where this plane intersects the surface is our initial path. Then use the method Euclid demonstrated. For a given point on the initial path, draw a line perpendicular to it, and then along that line, one path spacing away, draw another point. This new point must exist on another path. To sample this path, we will need to find many of these points, so we will need to make this calculation at as many points as we have sampled on the initial path. Furthermore, this line connecting the two paths has to be perpendicular to the initial path, but also tangent to the surface at the initial point, so that we actually draw these paths on the surface. Otherwise, our sampled point on the next path could be anywhere along this circle. In three dimensions, you only need two numbers to specify the direction of a vector, so we have sufficient criteria to define the direction in which the new point must be placed, tangent to the surface and perpendicular to the path. Now, another way to say tangent to the surface is to say perpendicular to the surface normal, basically saying perpendicular to perpendicular to the surface. The surface normal is a direction that is normal to the surface tangent plane, so we need to define a vector that is perpendicular to both the path direction at the initial point and the surface normal at the initial point. In three-dimensional space, the cross product of two vectors yields a vector that is perpendicular to both, so we can use this operation to find this direction. But how do we find the vectors that go into this operation? Well, the path direction vector can be approximated by subtracting the coordinates of one sampled point on the path with an adjacent sampled point on the path. The closer these points are, the more accurate this approximation will be. The distance I set between these sampled points is about 0.1 millimeters, which seems to work just fine. The normal vector, on the other hand, is something that is given to us by the initial input to any slicer, the STL file. STL files consist of a list of triangles, each one being defined by 12 numbers. The Cartesian coordinates for each of the three vertices, and the Cartesian components of the normal vector, stating the orientation of the triangle. 
I'm skipping through a lot of the coding here, but it was a big step to just write a function to parse through the STL file and evaluate the geometry as a surface function z of x and y so that any point on the surface can be found. Let's just keep focusing on the math. So once you cross the surface normal with the path direction, you get a vector of some length, it doesn't matter, in the direction of the sampled point on the new path. Dividing this vector by its magnitude or length gives a vector in the same direction, but of unit length, or a length of 1. Then, multiplying this by the path spacing, you get a vector that has a length equal to the path spacing. The point at the end of this vector, whose coordinates are given by the coordinates of the initial point plus the components of this vector, is approximately where your sampled point on the new path is going to be. Now, of course, these vectors, however small, are straight lines. If your surface is curved, this can't be exactly the point you want, as it's not on the surface. It is close, but not quite. How I elected to solve this is just to project the point downward onto the surface. Remember how I talked about defining a function z of x and y, so any point on the surface can be evaluated? Well, plug in the x and y coordinates of the point at the end of the vector, and the output of this function gives the z value of the projected point, which is finally the sampled point on the new path. Again, to fully define this path, we have to complete this computation for every single one of the sampled points on the initial path. I also have several functions to smooth the path using a running average and fill in any gaps via linear interpolation. But the gist of it is, given an initial path, we can find all the other paths, propagating outward in both directions until the whole surface is covered. So that covers the top layer of the slicing, but what if you want several contoured layers so it gets really smooth? Well, you can complete the same operation for all of those layers, whose geometries are close to the top layer, but not quite. The way I found these subsurface layer geometries is to take the initial STL, which I have converted to just a set of points at the centroids of the triangles with normal vectors at each of the centroids. This way, each point on the surface has a corresponding normal vector. For each of these points, subtract the normal vector multiplied by the layer height, which I set as 0.3 millimeters. This gives you the layer immediately below the surface layer. You can repeat this in sequence to get even lower layers. Now eventually this will stop working when two of the points end up crossing and your surface ceases to make sense. But for my tests, I used as many as five of these contour layers without error. I even orthogonally alternated the direction of the initial bisecting plane that defines the initial path every layer, so that the paths of a given layer would cross-hatch the paths of the layer above and below it, just like in regular 3D printing infill. So in a very basic sense, this is how I generated my paths. I thought this was the most interesting aspect. I also defined the border of the contour layers through a similar method, though this time the initial path is the intersection of the altitude or z equals zero plane with the surface, or in the case that the bottom surface isn't flat, like with Spider-Man eyes, just the points defining the outer border of the STL. Of course, below all of these contour layers, I had to write an ordinary 2.5 dimensional planar slicer which presented its own challenges, and was somehow harder? I didn't do a great job with this part, but since it's not the main idea of this project and it'll all be smoothed over at the top by the contours, I didn't worry about it too much. And I'm not going to describe my methodology here because it's clear every single existing slicer uses a method far better than mine for planar slicing. And then of course getting all of these paths into G-code was its own thing as well, which I still need to perfect. My initial testing of the G-code revealed a couple things. It appeared in the infill for the planar slicing I left a single point out of place, which caused the extruder to travel to the other end of the part every time I drew a line. I fixed that, but then there was this weird sort of piecewise behavior where the printer didn't smoothly interpolate the points and seemed to pause at one of the points in regular time intervals, and I still to this day do not know where that is coming from. My path planning for the planar slicer wasn't very good, as I said, so it ended up leaving bits of plastic among the inside infill, as it ran across it to complete the wall infill. But of course, I was waiting in anticipation of the contoured layers. Surely, I thought, surely, this can't possibly work on the first try. But then... Ooh! I couldn't believe my eyes. The printer was perfectly following the surface, following the paths I had created. I was incredibly impressed with myself. Until...
Yikes. So I hadn't inserted the layer transition into the G-code correctly. I wanted the nozzle to go up to a safe altitude, then move to the X and Y coordinates of the first point of the next layer, and then move down to the Z coordinate of that first point. This would avoid any collision with the part. But of course, I accidentally told it to just go straight there, ignoring that the part was in its way. After fixing this in the misplaced point, but not the stuttering or the stringing, the print went slightly faster, for about four hours, and the contoured layers worked like a charm. I had achieved true non-planar contoured 3D printing, and it was beautiful. But I still hadn't used it to make lenses. I started with a 3D scan of a lens that already fits into the frame of my mask. The reflective version seems to mess with the 3D scan, so then I tried scanning the red version I had made before. This worked, and I was able to make a shape close to it in Fusion 360. Running the STL through my slicer in the version that made the fully contoured part made it clear there were some initial problems. It's sort of a different problem trying to make a thin contoured part with edges that don't lie on the ground. I had to modify the way I accounted for the smoothing so that the paths didn't stretch to the ground but rather stretch to the edge of the border of the desired shape in the XY plane. After this and several other modifications, it was clear we were getting somewhere. Eventually, I got usable G-code. I opted to use Cheetah, one of my favorite NinjaTech thermoplastic polyurethane filaments, as the support material. It would be used to print the normal planar structure underneath the contours, as well as the two contoured layers on top of that. Then I wanted to try this pretty silk PLA filament that had a shiny orange color for the actual lens material. I knew TPU and PLA didn't adhere well to one another from another project I was working on concerning web shooter triggers, more on that later. The printing was going pretty well. I instituted a one minute pause to allow me to change filament, as my printer doesn't have dual extruders. But please buy my merch so I can afford one that does, it's literally perfect for this project. The end result was pretty cool. My hypothesis that the TPU support would easily be separable from the PLA was definitely supported. The issue came with inserting the lens into the frame. It was clear the shape wasn't quite right. Could it be that the iPhone 11 3D scanner wasn't totally accurate? Who knew? To fix this problem, I had to just continually update the shape, print it, try to put it into the frame. Eventually, after many, many iterations, I finally gave in to the fact that I might need to do some trimming for this iteration of the project. I offset the boundary of the lens shape to add area on all sides, and then printed that shape, which I would then trim based upon the shape of the lens that already fits into the frame. After a couple more iterations of shapes, I found a geometry that worked, and after some finishing and trimming, I had my first 3D printed lens sitting snug in my mask. All I had to do to get the other lens was to flip the geometry that went into the slicer, and voila! A fully complete The Amazing Mask with shining orange eyes. 
I wanted to try a different color with these same files, partly to demonstrate to myself how quickly I can make new versions of this lens, if I'm feeling like a change. I thought this shiny sapphire blue color would look cool, and maybe be closer to the original style of the mask. And I was right, I thought it looked pretty great. One thing I noticed that was different between the orange and blue lenses was the blue seemed to be a bit easier to see out of, despite the lines being the same thickness and distance apart. I figured this could be because the blue doesn't reflect as much light into my eyes as the lighter orange color does, but I also definitely noticed my eye being slightly visible through the blue from the outside, so that's also not ideal. The last thing I wanted was to try a different eye shape. Luckily, I didn't have to try to fit this one into a frame, which was probably the most nightmarish part of this whole project. But I did want to show the versatility for the slicer. I designed this eye with some more convex features that you might see in some of the Spidey comics, and I went to see if my slicer and printer could handle it. The slicer ended up doing okay, but eventually it became clear that I had a very clogged nozzle, and the support material suffered, meaning there were some defects in the printed mesh. I've had this nozzle clog problem with Cheetah before, and it stems from the fact that my printer doesn't have a direct drive extruder, which is the right way to print flexible filaments. But all in all, I can really see the potential for this slicer as a first step to a 3D printer specifically for super suits. I mean, you remember the scene from Far From Home. Peter's all zoned in on making his new suit in the Stark plane. He's listening to Led Zeppelin. Oh, I love Led Zeppelin! And once the design is complete, this 3D printer on the plane just makes the suit for him. I mean, how awesome would that be in real life? The first step toward that is understanding the kinematics behind multi-axis manufacturing systems, and I know I've enjoyed learning a lot about that throughout the duration of this project. So what do you guys think? Should I go with the orange? The blue? Some combination of both? And are you keen on trying this out for yourselves? I'm pleased to inform you that you can. For free! Now for those of you who don't know, I am standing in the headquarters of Dragline Dynamics, the world's first spider community laboratory. We develop new web fluids, web shooters, and pretty much anything else that may benefit the advancement of real-life superhero technology. There's only one problem. This is not a real place. Yet. In case you haven't seen my main pitch video, please go check it out. But essentially, I am aiming to get a primordial version of this lab up and running in August of next year. And it's going to be awesome the one-stop shop for advancing spider technologies, the best of which will be made available to you. And that starts with this slicer, which I am proud to introduce as the open source software Dragline Draw. Now, as you can see from this video, Dragline Draw is in its infancy. Currently, it can only be operated through its code on MATLAB, which not many people have access to, and I am planning on converting it to Python eventually, which is free. MATLAB is just the best mathematical toolbox in programming, and this project required a lot of mathematics, as you can imagine. So if you happen to have access to MATLAB, please visit our GitHub page and download Dragline Draw version 1. Make sure to grab the STL read function as well, and keep it in the same folder. If you don't have MATLAB, I implore you to still check out the GitHub page, as you can download the G-code for my eye to try it out. It should work with your printer as long as your bed is bigger than 6x6 inches. Again, eventually, this software will be more user-friendly. I just wanted to get it out there as open source as soon as possible. So please, to support Dragline, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash theamazing, or buy a nice hoodie or a nice mug at my Spreadshirt shop, which can be accessed in the store tab on my YouTube channel. As one of my patrons, you can find STL files for some of the 3D print projects I've done before. And if you're watching from the future, most, if not all, of the 3D print projects I'm doing from now on. Every bit helps. And with your support, one day, Dragline Dynamics will have a device just like we see in Far From Home. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the.amazing.labs for more frequent updates. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay amazing.